What is up, my friends, and welcome to the UFL Week in Review, one of the longest-running UFL podcasts in human history. I'm your host, Mark Perry, diving into everything UFL. We've got the aftermath of Week 2. We're setting the stage for what's to come in Week 3. We've got the latest power rankings, quarterback rankings, plus game-dated moment cards from Upper Deck, which is pretty cool, and behind-the-scenes look at the D.C. Defenders' first home game that me and my wife went to, plus I give blood in that. We'll also discuss the UFLPA's recent grievance, and we'll take a look at the UFL TV ratings. And you don't want to miss our preview of Week 3's with the odds, spreads, and DFS picks so that you can make some money. And then our notes section, we touch on some stories around the league, including partnerships, ticket promotions, community engagement, stuff like that. So buckle up while we do all things UFL. And whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on iTunes, Spotify, always hit the like button and subscribe. Leave us a review. You can also email us at podcast at uflnewshub.com or call 888-430-7692, extension 3, with your questions or comments for any show. That being said, let's get into it. The USFL is in business. The XFL is underway. There's no doubt spring just got stronger. All right, we've got a UFL power rankings for week two from our main man, Jonathan Klink. He's got it up there. So number one, of course, Birmingham Stallions, 2-0, undefeated. They defeated Arlington. They defeated Michigan. They are definitely the number one team. Number two, shocker to all of us, but not a shocker anymore, the San Antonio Brahmas. They defeated our D.C. Defenders, America's team in week one. Week two, they defeated Memphis on the road, 20-19. to uh, Memphis is still a good team, too, so they stay at number two. At number three, the St. Louis Battlehawks. They are now um, one and one. They lost to Michigan on the road, and then they defeated Arlington at home, 27 to 24. So now they're back in the game. Uh, but are they the super dominant team that we thought of? That remains to be seen. AJ McCarron, 19 of 29, passes 248 yards and two touchdowns. Marcel Aitman is still a guy you should have in your fantasy lineup every week in their running game. Mateo Durant looks like maybe he could be the guy. Again, these teams are figuring this stuff out as we move along during the season, but St. Louis is number four. He's got um, number three. Number four, he's got the Michigan Panthers. They defeated the Battlehawks at home, but then they lost to Birmingham. That's tough. They were previously three. He dropped them down to four. Still, I'm still not high on Michigan Panthers, but again, they did. They played one of the best teams in the league in week one and the best team in week two. It'll be really interesting to see how the Pittsburgh Panthers, or Michigan Panthers, I should say, do in week three. Number five, one and one, your America's team, D.C. Defenders. They lost to San Antonio, defeated Houston at home. Wasn't a convincing win. They were previously number seven. They moved up to five. We will see how they play this week. I'm a little concerned. Uh, can they pull it together? But D.C. Defenders with the win, and it was kind of a come-from-behind win. Houston was playing them pretty well during that game. Arlington Renegades at six. They were previously at number five. They lost to Birmingham, and then they lost to St. Louis. They're 0-2, but again, those are two of the top teams. Arlington now takes on the D.C. Defenders So this Saturday. That is tough. We will see, I, but I'm worried about this game. To be honest with you, I'm worried about this game. They are at number six. Memphis Showboats at seven. They were previously at six. Defeated Houston, and then but they lost to San Antonio. Again, this is a show-out week for uh, the Memphis Showboats. I think they're one of the top teams in the league, but we will have to see how they play out. Week three, I think, is the last time that we'll see kind of where potentially things might go as teams start to gel. And then after week three, then it's on off to the races. And of course, number eight is your Houston Roughnecks at 0 and 2. Previously, eight, they lost um, the starting quarterback, Jarrett Guarantanamo, left the game early, and he's out. And Reed Sinnott came in, uh, looks a lot better. Of course, Kurt Merritt uh, got injured. Unfortunately, that was a bad injury with a dislocated wrist. We saw that. We were on the field sawing that prayers out to him. That was really tough watching that. But that is your number eight team in the UFL. There you have it. Those are the rankings. Let us know what you think in the comments. I'm a little, uh, I, I would agree with Birmingham and San Antonio at two, St. Louis at three. Michigan Panthers, he's high on Michigan Panthers. I probably have DC a little bit higher. But really, once this week plays out, we will see who the true uh, championship material teams are in the UFL. Breaking down the latest UFL quarterback rankings, Aaron Sauter has got the details for you here. Number one, he's got A.J. McCarron, the St. Louis Battlehawks. 
Chase Garbers, number two. He's a guy I think you should put in your DFS lineups. Luis Perez, he's got number three at the, uh, the 0-2 Arlington Renegades. I think that's interesting. But he has played well, competing 21 out of 29 passes for 233 yards and one touchdown. He also rushed for 19 yards on seven attempts during the loss to the Battlehawks. He showed consistency with a 100, uh, 151.3 quarterback rating. So he's got Luis, per Luis Perez at number three. Jordan Tamu, America's team, D.C. Defenders quarterback, played a lot better this week, completed 16 of 32 passes for 212 yards, resulting in two touchdowns, one pick. He also ran the ball five times for 17 yards. Uh, his quarterback rating is 120. It was enough to lead the defenders to their first UFL victory in 2024. But again, I think he's missing the wide receivers. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Kiki Kuti like dropped an easy big time catch that he could have had. That would have been for big yardage using the tight ends more. It just makes me concerned about the wide receiving group. We'll see this week uh, how things play out, but I'm concerned. I am concerned the DC defenders against the Arlington Renegades in that revenge match uh, might not come out on top. Number five, Case Cookus. Uh, yeah, he's been kind of okay. Uh, quarterback rating of 118.1. Uh, don't have a problem with him being down there. I thought Case Cookus would be a top three quarterback in the UFL. Again, uh, Memphis Showboats are one and one. Tough loss that they had. Michigan Panthers, EJ Perry. Again, uh, one and one as well. Uh, 20 of 33 passes, 203 yards, resulting in one touchdown and an interception. He played well, 116.2 in losing effort. Reed Sinnott came in of the Houston Roughnecks. He looked a lot better than what they had going on with Jarrett Gu Guarantano. Uh, and he came in, found himself a good opportunity. 19 of 30, 221 yards and one touchdown, no interception. Played well enough to earn a 136.2. Uh, so him leading the Roughnecks in week three seems to be where I think he should be getting the start. It'll be interesting to see how they play with him under center. And finally, number eight, the Birmingham Stallions. They're 2-0, and but their quarterback situation is kind of wonky. Adrian Martinez is supposedly going to start over Matt Corral. Um, they both could kind of, but they'll both be playing. So this rotation definitely in DFS and fantasy stay away from them. Martinez averaged a one on one on. 102.6 quarterback rating corral was a 62.1 giving them to compare a collective of 82.4 so we'll see how uh, this plays out but i think maybe adrian martinez might be the guy for the birmingham stallion stallions and where's jamar smith is he not even close to that thing but man this is a bad look for matt Cor corral to be on the top team but not being that starting quarterback he has not played well we will see how things go. Week three, I think, is going to shake out everything. And then we go into week four. We'll know who the players are and who not the players are. Upper Deck announced. Now, I only knew this because I get the emails from Upper Deck. No official announcement from the UFL. But they're doing game-dated moment cards. And you can get them. It's only for a limited time. It's for about a week. Uh, and so far, there's been only five. They're supposed to release more today. We'll see if they do that. But UFL game-dated cards look to be a weekly thing throughout the UFL 2024 season. Each week, four cards come out, and fans can purchase them for $5.99. Those cards are only available for the week and are gone once the new batch of weekly cards is announced every Friday. This week's cards includes four moments from week one. We have the kickoff of the inaugural season in Arlington. Then we had the... Uh, Papali toe drag to haul in a touchdown for the Showboats victory. Bates hitting that 64-yard field goal to lift the Panthers. And then Wing uh, throws a 40-yard touchdown pass to Alex Millette on that trick play. Those are the four cards. You can get uh, silver or you can get gold as like bonuses. So basically what you do is you buy one and then you kind of open the pack digitally. And then you can see if you got the regular one or the silver one or the gold one. And then from there, you could keep it in your account. Or you can do what I did um, later on, is that you can actually have it shipped. And actually, I have some UFL cards from last year. So these were digital cards. Uh, Madre London. I had uh, Alex Magoo, Carson Strong. Uh, you had the original cards, and then they'll send you the original cards, and it's got like some information on the back. Uh, the other one I got was... Um, Reggie Corbin. It's funny, like, I don't think any of these guys are in the UFL right now. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, you can get cards. So this is what you can get later on. I think it says eight to 10 weeks. But um, uh, just another fun thing to be a, a, a collector of, of this kind of stuff. And I think this is a cool thing. Hopefully we get more cards as the league grows. But I'm excited to at least that we have some UFL cards that we can buy and trade. But I'm just keeping them all. I just enjoy them. I mean, I have XFL original 2020 card packs and i was hoping that they would do that but again everything has been the bare minimum at least upper deck is doing something and then hopefully maybe we'll get some more cards if they sell well in the future just head over to upperdeck.com and you can find all the information there hey football fans just because the nfl season has wrapped doesn't mean the thrill of fantasy football has to end introducing newshubfantasy.com your year-round fantasy football haven Dive into the action with the United Football League and Canadian Football League. Whether it's the UFL's dynamic plays or the CFL's strategic battles, we've got you covered with fantasy leagues and weekly pick'em games that keep the competition fierce and the stakes high all season long. Best of all, it's absolutely free. Join existing leagues to challenge the community or create private leagues to compete with friends. With NewsHubFantasy.com, the game never stops. Strategy, camaraderie, and the chase for fantasy football glory continues beyond the NFL, bringing you closer to the sport you love every day. Don't sit on the sidelines. Visit NewsHubFantasy.com today, sign up for free, and keep your fantasy football season going. Because here, the game never ends. NewsHubFantasy.com where football fantasy lives all year round. Here's a report about UFL advertising rates in the U.S. Army sponsorship. We learned some more about this. So according to a report from Sportico's Anthony Krupe, he's got some interesting information. One is that UFL advertising costs average $6,570 per 30-second spot, and the U.S. Army invested $10 million in a one-year UFL sponsorship. And I, uh, I assume that that's probably more than what the XFL wanted a couple of years ago. Uh, and also total sales for eight games are estimated to be in the advertising realm, 3.7 million. So he goes through, basically this article was about the St. Louis market and how the other markets are kind of struggling. And they basically, the Battle Hawks are carrying the league with the DC Defenders, America's team, kind of in second place. He also talks about, but what he did say at the end of the article was the talking about the advertising costs in the UFL. He says, quote, the average cost for an in-game UFL spot is a thrifty $6,570 per 30-second spot. While that's probably a bit more than, than what you would find in a sofa cushion. Okay, you're so funny. The low rates have set a modest ceiling on revenue per media buyer estimates. Fox and Disney have booked $3.7 million in sales over the first eight games which works out to a hair shy of $465,000 per telecast. That's basically what they're making now. So despite these low costs, Fox and Disney has successfully generated approximately, we all know that. Uh, the pricing strategy has made UFL games an accessible platform for advertisers, allowing them to reach audiences at a reasonable cost. That is kind of the key here. And as we, each week of the season moves on and the TV numbers remain strong, things could change. And, and again, this is a good spot for the first year league. Now, first some comparison an nfl game 30 second spot on espn can range in the 300,000. so that's right so what they make in one game is essentially what they make in one nfl 30 second spot uh network games can net in seven hundred thousand dollars. that kind of gives you the idea but that again is the national football league the biggest player in town nba playoff games can range five fifty thousand to seventy five thousand, depending on the network so that kind of gives you an idea of where um network games i couldn't find anything about nba games or mls that kind of stuff but that just kind of gives you a ballpark of kind of where things are. and that's nba playoff games so assuming regular season nba games is going to be at least half that uh to keep that in mind as far as tv viewership goes the nfl is between 15 to 17 million dollar 15 17 million range of viewers mlb and nba are kind of in that 1.6 to 1.4 million uh, range, but leagues like MLS average 850,000 viewers, and they just signed an exclusive 10-year, 2.5 billion agreement with Apple. That is that is kind of the key, and this is the benchmark that Redbird Capital um, 
compares itself to is MLS. They, they believe that they could be bigger than MLS. They could be the fifth biggest sports league in the country with major, uh, with NFL, major league baseball, uh, NBA soccer. Now it's like MLS, WNBA, UFL. They feel like they could be in that range. And that is a lot of money. Also, the U.S. Uh, US Army's sponsorship role, so also doing its part to support the startup, is the U.S. Army, which has earmarked $10 million for a one-year present, presenting sponsorship designed to bolster its recruiting efforts. We saw the commercials where they're interviewing, or during the games, they're interviewing people trying to get their recruiting up. There you go. They got $10 million for that. So that's just something to keep in mind. I thought these intro, these articles were interesting. Definitely read the full article because it was giving you some insights about the St. Louis Battlehawks. But this kind of gives us an idea of what the league is making. They are not going to come across this season at losing sixty million dollars. Hopefully, if they even they they just break even, that is a great sign. We just want to break even would be fantastic news for season one. Even though we've been doing this and talking about this since twenty eighteen, season one of the UFL. So the UFL PA files a grievance relating to the UFL player of the week bonuses. So the UFL put out the following press release. They said our union filed a grievance challenge the USFL's the UFL's decision not to elect or and award individual player bonuses for those selected as player of the week. The union's claim is that the reluctancy by the league to administer player compensation and benefits is in violation of the collective bargaining agreement. It was our intent in negotiating player accolade bonuses that individuals who earn weekly performances based on awards would be compensated based on their body of work. The union has requested that weekly individual player bonuses be administered accordingly. Pursuant to the adopted CBA, we have begun discussions with the league operations to resolve this issue in order to avoid litigation proceedings. This is their statement that came out on April 8th. When was it announced? Well, we broke down. When it was announced, we broke down the UFL player salary based on what the UFL PA said. There was a section on there about how players can earn extra money through various bonuses and winning player of the week, which comes with a thousand dollar bonus. The problem is the UFL has not announced any players of the week since the league, since the season started at the end of March. The UFL does have a weekly UFL MVP race uh, on the official website, which according to the UFL PA, the winner of that will get a 7,500 bonus. As of the recording of making of this article, the UFL did release an announcement about the UFL Sportsman of the Year Award, which the winner would be announced at the UFL Championship game in St. Louis on June 16th, but no word on any, any bonus that comes along with it. Kind of wonky. Did somebody drop the ball? Did no one notice? I mean, we're going into week three, and there's like no player of the weeks, defensive player of the weeks, anything. Just to uh, – I'm with the UFL PA. Why not? give the players a little compensation for being player of the week. It just helps the league. It was in part of their agreement. So I don't know why it's here. Well, hopefully this gets resolved and we start getting players of the week uh, going here forward. But again, remember this league is so bare bones that there's going to be mistakes all over the place as they kind of work out the kinks for the first year. But uh, this, this one, come on. It's easy. I'm surprised. It's just extra content player of the week and who just to have Moose Johnson pick the players. You don't have to have this big elaborate thing. And uh, so we'll see if this happens and things change this week. We have this week's UFL TV ratings for week two. Sue checking in ratings for the second week. Mike Mitchell's got them right here. San Antonio, Memphis, 718,000 Arlington at St. Louis. 908,000 on ABC. The first game was on ESPN. On Sunday's game, Michigan Birmingham Stallion, uh, Birmingham Stallions, Michigan Panthers on ESPN, 903,000. And then Houston against America's team, DC Defenders, 849,000. Those are the viewers. You remember, they had to go up against the NCAA tournament, Major League Baseball. So I think this is pretty uh, good turnout for the numbers as well. Um, as far as attendance goes, we have those numbers for you. Uh, attendance at the um, Showboats game, 8,791 uh, 8, for the Showboats Brahmas game. And then the Battlehawks Renegades game, 40,317 with a 908,000 rating. And then the Michigan Panthers 
Birmingham Stallions with the Stallions taking the win. 7,475 fans in attendance, 9,903,000 9, for the ratings. DC Defenders, America's team, 15,052, rating of 849,000. I mean, I was hoping 16 to 18,000 for the DC Defenders. There was a Washington Nationals game right next door. Still, the crowd was good the second best crowd in the UFL. But again, that stadium can only pack out totally about 20,000. So I was hoping for a little bit more, but 15,000 is okay. I'll take it. But again, the attendance for the Michigan Panthers, they have another home game, I believe, this weekend. So the DC Defenders will be in Arlington. Uh, Stallions, Michigan Panthers have another home game, and then the Brahmas are at home. So I'm hopeful that the Brahmas actually have a good turnout because their team is two and zero. Oh. they had a good league season good team in the aaf as far as attendance goes would love to see twenty thousand in a brahma's game not sure about that panthers with three games in a row 12 p.m start on sunday is that going to impact things against going against the houston roughnecks i mean the panthers are a decent team they should beat the roughnecks we'll see how that goes and then stallions this is there's a lot of intrigue in, in what these attendance numbers will be. I think the TV ratings will stay in that 800, 700,000, maybe 900,000. Maybe we can even pop a, a million based on because now there's not much competition, I believe, except for the Masters. But, um, you know, you've got the Arlington Renegades. Are they mid, they're kind of mid range Birmingham Stallions? I mean, if they don't show out and they get a 7,000, 8,000, a two-time defending champion and one of the top and the top team in the league, I mean, what does that say about the Birmingham Stallions market? Michigan Panthers, I would assume it's going to be less than what they had before and Brahmas. So it, this attendance thing is going to be really interesting to watch. Ratings, I think, are good. I think if we get 800, 700,000, remember, we were getting into like 400,000 range, uh, you know, with the XFL and UFL at times. So we will see, I'm sure it will drop off a little bit more, but anything in that seven, 800,000, I would totally be happy with again, but these are on network television. You've got ESPN game Fox and then two ABC games on Sunday. So it will be interesting to see how these attendance numbers and rating numbers turn out for week three. We've got our UFL odds, our betting picks, all that kind of stuff. If you go to our website, we have the breakdown of the television and the odds and all that good fun stuff, including understanding the base in, basis, what's point spread, all that other fun stuff. Here are my picks. So you've got the DC Defenders at Arlington Renegades. This is Saturday, April 13th at 1 p.m. Uh, I This was tough, my friends. Point spread is minus two to the Defenders. I think Arlington is going to win this game. They're home. Arlington has been playing everybody well. They played two tough teams. I think they're going to beat the DC Defenders. I don't want to bet against my team. I have put no money on this game. I put zero money because I'm betting against my team. I think they'll actually get the over. I think Arlington's offense is, is cranking. DC's kind of figured things out. I think they can both get over I, I, that. And I think the Renegades are going to win. So I picked the Renegades. I picked the over. We shall see, my friends. We shall see. I think both teams are getting the offenses clicking. I think the offenses played better last week than they did this week. So I'm taking the over in this one, even though it's the highest rated over of all the games. But I'm taking, I think, I, I know I don't want them to win, but I have a feeling they will. And I got to be honest with myself. Memphis Showboats at Birmingham Stallions. I've taken Memphis. I think this game is going to be closer than seven points. Stallions minus seven. I'm taking the over, a 41. And I think the Stallions will win, but I think Memphis will keep it close. I think Memphis has a good team. They could upset. They could upset the Showboats. But again, we'll see what that crowd is going to look like. Houston Roughnecks at Michigan Panthers. The Panthers' third straight home game. I think Houston will cover. Well, the Panthers are minus three. I think Houston will keep it close. I think it will be the under. I don't think 38 and a half. I will take the under, but I'm taking Panthers to win. I think this is going to be a close game. Um, as well, Houston kept it close with DC. Michigan Panthers have been close. We know about the field goal, so I think this game will be close. Um, but I'm sick picking the Panthers to win. I'm taking the under. St. Louis Battlehawks at San Antonio Brahmas. This is another tough one, man. I think the St. Louis Battlehawks 
are going to lose to the San Antonio Brahmas. The Battle Hawks are minus two. I'm taking the Brahmas. I'm taking the over. It's 42, and I'm picking the Brahmas there. Uh, Finn's parlay. He's got San Antonio with the points, Houston, Michigan under, and the Stallions win. That is the parlay. I'm also doing over, over, under, over. One dollar pays thirteen, and I'm taking the money line. Uh, I'm taking. Oh, um, I forget what this one is, but those are basically my three. I'm not picking anything against DC. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, but those are my. T- that's Finn's parlay, and of course, going for the over, over, under, over. One dollar pays thirteen. So just try and have a little fun with that. Those are my picks for this week in the UFL. You got to watch and listen to the recap show on Mondays to figure to learn about what's going on or how we did. I'm not going to recap it on this show. DraftKings lineup. I think I got a solid one here. I'm going with Chase Garbers at quarterback CJ Maribel at running back Marcel Aitman every time. Uh, Marquez Stevenson has been a guy for San Antonio to keep an eye on. Dawood Davis has been a guy each week as well. And then uh, 4,600, I got Marcus Sims in the Panthers defense. I got You got to go with Chase Garbers. He's kind of the top guy right now in the league. He's got the best offense in the league and one of the top teams. So that's who I'm going with there. Um, our main man um, sent in his picks. Jim checking in. He said it was an ugly feeling confident on the uh, – he says, well, that was ugly feeling confident after picking Dundee, ended up taking McFarlane. Wade, uh, can't trust the corral split even if it goes into golden corral mode. I keep hitting on Pearson, though. They mispriced him again this week. Roland McCarron this week. Uh, let's see. We got his pick. He's got Roland McCarron. Uh, keeping, I keep hitting on Pearson, though. They mispriced uh, Roland McCarron this week. It was him or Perry for me. Chase Garbers has me feeling like that would be chasing garbage this week after that last second shenanigans. Uh, totally sold on Aitman as I am and like, still like Shepard, Akeem Butler in the slot is not going to be stat friendly. I run it back through with Stevenson, which I did as well with so many targets and cheaper than Kirkland. I agree with that. Rounding that with Deion Kane superior by a mile and the stallions defense. So he's got good picks too. Um, I am, I, I just don't like doing two St. Louis guys because I'm afraid that they're not going to put up a ton of points and you got to spread that out, but he's going super St. Louis, but I think San Antonio is going to win this game. It's about that time. New gear. Third time heading to Audi field for the opening kickoff of the DC defenders. First it was with Vince McMahon owning it. Then it was the rock and Danny Garcia. And now under the UFL, there it is. The UFL banner. And that was, so this journey for me started in 2018, covering the XFL rather than the AAF. And it's bring me a long journey. Lots of change, lots of things have changed. Now I'm dealing with my wife who has cancer at 49 years old. Um, another website. I mean, we have had XFL, USFL, CFL news hubs, apps and all sorts of stuff. We have news hub fantasy now which actually is running pretty well, and uh, some other ideas in the future. And it all really depends on how this league does. If, if this league does well and becomes a thing and can stand for 5, 10, 20 years, then we're off to the races. Got a lot of good ideas and a lot of um, things to bring to the table. This is the year that we find out. St. Louis, you showed out. 40,000 fans last night. That's awesome. D.C., we need to show out too. And now it's up to us. I keep telling you all this. It's up to us. The groundwork has been laid. The foundation is here. It's up to us to make this league work and to get popular. Bring your friends. Go to a bar, restaurant, watch a game. Whatever you need to do to promote this league. But uh, this is our first game back at it in Audi Field. It's nicer. We're in April rather than February, which is kind of cool. But I am super excited to get back with the crew, the DC Defenders, fan the dc defenders nation so let's go along for the ride shall we? Thank you. all right hello we are here season two I guess i got a special guest right here she is back at can you think she had suffering from sepsis two months ago in the hospital could barely talk through god's grace she made it to the first game so we're very excited and we're headed to walters it's crowded down here because of the washington nationals are playing 
and we're just excited to get in and get after it and uh, get a win. Let's go. So one observation we had was that we were used to coming here in February and actually there's baseball. So she was like, wow, I didn't even notice the baseball stadium was right there, let the alone you can walk in. right there. Yeah. The amount of times we've been down here, it's there's been no baseball. The first time was 2020 and they shut it, shut it down. And then maybe there was one baseball game last year that we were thinking that we were here. So it's just... Weird to be down here with the first game of the season and not freezing your you-know-what's off. All right, now we're headed to the stadium. We kind of peeked into the different little spots. So you got Walters and Solus Brewing. I always keep forgetting what it is. Are two of the spots that people are head to before the game, but we're about an hour to kick off. Kind of arrived a little bit later than what we wanted to, but it's kind of my fault probably. Uh, so now we're gonna head over to the stadium for the first time since last year. A lot has changed, but hopefully one thing that hasn't changed is undefeated at home. So that's it. What an exciting finish. And staying undefeated out of Audi Field. That's good. How do you feel? Good. Excited. Tired. Tired. Yeah. So, but great atmosphere. Didn't hear what the uh, attendance was even during the game. I didn't hear it. I haven't seen it posted. I don't think it was a big, as big as normal games. One of the weird things was they were selling DC Defenders XFL merch which we were looking at it and we were like, oh cool, this is a cool shirt and then it had XFL on it. And I was kind of like, yeah, but I get it. You know, you're trying to unload the merchandise from it's last year. It still says DC. It does, so it does. I'm just being, you know, whatever. But I think a lot more fans came out and I just think it will grow. I mean, that, it was a big win. 
I think DC's got to, you know, their offense is not the same as it was last year. They lost a lot of key components. We saw Lucky Jackson on the sidelines. You know, a lot of some of those guys are in the NFL now. So, but overall, again, it's always a fun atmosphere. People are really cool. Like everybody's it's having a, a good time. Place. Yeah. Any final words? That's it. That's see, it. You, see you soon for the next game. It'll be fun. Yep. We'll see you for the next one. What is up, my friends? So it is a couple days later. It is Wednesday. I am here at the American Red Cross. The DC Defenders won. So that means we got to give blood. See, there's, there's nothing on my arms right this second. See, proof that I'm here. So uh, let's go in and check it out. Of course, I got to wear the DC Defenders hat. All right, my friends, that's a wrap. Proof right here. And it's red too, DC Defenders. Process was good, took about, I mean, my blood was pumping. So I went out, I was done like six minutes or so, then you just have to wait 15 minutes to, uh, you know, just to make sure that everything is cool. And that was it. So now we just gotta wait 56 days to the next time we can do it. So hopefully DC wins at the end of the week and or at the end of the month. So that I can schedule my next time doing, but there's platelet donations that you can do and all sorts of other things um, aside from just giving blood. So, and it's def definitely needed, and uh, you know, it's something that uh, you got plenty of it, so you can give it out. You just you need to just set the time to do it, and, and it certainly will help someone. It certainly help save my wife's life. So, I will be a frequent user, a frequent doer of of this throughout the whole season. So, there's your proof done waiting to do it again so dc you gotta win let's go in football every play counts towards the win just like every click counts towards growing your business at cm3 solutions we're the game changers you need with our cutting edge seo strategies we'll put your business in the top league ensuring you're seen by the fans that matter most your customers and when it comes to web design we craft winning plays with stunning websites that not only look great but perform. From the first click, your audience is engaged with user-friendly designs that score big on customer satisfaction. Need a custom app? We've got the playbook to bring your vision to life, enhancing your digital presence and driving your business forward. So, whether it's SEO, web design, or application development, team up with CM3 Solutions. Let's score those business goals together. CM3 Solutions, where your business wins. Visit us today at cm3solutions.com. All right, we are back. Let's wrap things up. First, the United Football League introduces Sportsman of the Year Award. Uh, they will proudly announce Sportsman of the Year a continuing the tradition with the USFL sportsman of the year, a testament to incredible athletes making a difference in their communities. This award not only recognizes excellence on the field, but also celebrates the profound impact that our players have off the field as a role models and community leaders. Since they're all in one location, that's going to be kind of hard to do, but uh, you know, I think this is a good idea. It's a good award. No word on if there is going to be any compensation for that. I would assume there should be. On to ticket sales, $10 tickets now available for all Memphis Showboats games. It went from 20 to 10, uh, certain sections for all the remaining home games. Clearly, Memphis is have a problem in filling it, so they lowered the ticket prices to $10 at certain sections. We'll see how that goes if we get any more fans in the stands. This is one that worried me, the Birmingham Stallions also lowered their ticket prices for their home opener on April 13th. This is the two-time UFL champions lowering their sections. So seatings in sections 110 and 142 will be priced at $10. Again, just, just one section. It's not all the tickets in the league. But this to me is kind of a, a sign of a little bit worrisome about what Birmingham Stallions uh, is going to look like uh, for this home opener this week so keep an eye on that also lbl architects joins a community ticketing program for the arlington renegades 
uh, provides local businesses the opportunity to give back to their communities and nonprofit organizations to serve youth educational initiatives and life changing resources where they work or live. Uh, very excited about this. Basically, mission to be blessed. Um, so I guess they are going to give out, they'll donate tickets to different games and stuff like that uh, as part of the community ticketing program. A tiered pricing initiative that consists of three levels featuring different quantities of tickets and benefits. So that um, Arlington Renegades. All right, let's get to our email. Don checking in. He says, could call my friend. Week two is done. Now I have some questions and concerns. Are the preseason ranking good teams not as good as we thought? Absolutely. 100% it is not who we thought. And are the bad teams not as bad? Well, I knew Houston wasn't going to be good, but at San Antonio, I was on the fence with. I thought Memphis would be a little bit better, but it's too close to call just yet. I think this weekend will really shake it out. Uh, it looks like there is a lot more parity in this league than everyone thought. I agree with that. Even the Stallions, the undisputed kings of the USFL, did not dominate the Panthers. Birmingham is 2-0, and they're definitely the top-ranked team, but I am not ready to crown them with a wreath of roses just yet. I mean, they you saw our quarterback ranking. They were at the bottom when it comes to quarterback. Now it's only been two weeks, so there's still time for teams to make adjustments and make a move. But we saw last season, the season is only 10 weeks long and it goes by fast. So I guess what I'm saying is that any team can surprise me at this point. It's time for those adjustments to show improvement and to make a run for the title. Yes, now is the time. Basically, this is the last week. If San Antonio win, now the only thing is the Houston Roughnecks were on fire at the beginning of the season and petered off as teams figured them out. Is that going to happen to the San Antonio Brahmas again? Or are they going to be able to keep pace all season long? I really think it should be Birmingham and St. Louis in the championship. I think Birmingham, Birmingham, uh, St. Louis is who we thought they were. Birmingham is who they, we thought they were. We're a little disappointed in D.C. Defenders defense. A little disappointed in Memphis Showboats. Uh, Michigan Panthers are a little bit better than we thought of. Houston Roughnecks, you know, and 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 Arlington, I think, is a little bit better than, than we thought of. But this is a weekend that's really going to shake things out because we're basically three weeks in. You know, that you're basically over, you know, there's 10 weeks. So you're basically two more weeks and then you're halfway to the season. So this is really going to shake things out this weekend. So uh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun to watch. Make sure you tune in and we appreciate you guys. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We appreciate that. And thanks for tuning in. 888-430-7692, extension 3. Uh, things were a lot late this week. Got a lot of family stuff going on. My wife is doing good. Everything is fine. There's just a lot of stuff going on. You're trying to manage all this stuff. And actually, I'm going to drop her off at her treatment right now. So uh, that is it for me, folks. As always, God bless. And I will see you all later.